Now, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. That means it's a brain disorder. It has a genetic origin, which is still quite unknown. It starts incredibly early in life and it affects the brain and the mind. It affects it very seriously. And the condition known as autism is a condition that makes it almost impossible for the person affected to lead a, an ordinary, normal life. They need a lot of help, a lot of support. Now, autism was always with us, clearly, but it has not been named until the 1940s. And it was quite independently that it was identified by two people. One in Austria, Hans Asperger, who described a series of cases that he'd come across. He found something in common with these cases that he thought pointed to a particular kind of what he called psychopathy. Actually, it doesn't mean what we now mean by psychopathy. He meant it was not a debilitating disease. He meant it was something like a personality feature. These were people who didn't fit into groups, who were loners, who were strange, and who also sometimes had special talents. But he described these first cases in such a way that we could see that each individual was very, very different. So there is a whole range of individual differences. And at the same time, in America, Leo Kanner, a psychiatrist, also became aware of children in his practice who he thought had something in common. And it was exactly the same that Hans Asperger identified. It was an inability to relate to other people. They had a reasonably good ability to relate to objects and things in the world. But that's different from people. In fact, Kanna described very vividly a child who was in his consulting room who would pay more attention to the filing cabinet than to him. So these children did not seem to be especially affected by normal human interaction and communication. Kanna too decided that in his cases he often noticed some kind of special, what he called, eyelet of intelligence. For example, a child who would hardly speak in a spontaneous way. He couldn't really engage in conversation, but this child had a fantastic memory and could recite things by heart that uh, you know many, many people would just not be able to remember like that. So we have these descriptions in the 1940s and this was of course in the middle of World War II. So at first I think not much notice was given to these cases. But then, very soon thereafter, um, people began to see such cases everywhere. At first it was only a few and it was thought to be very rare. It was amongst the people who were in hospitals who were considered mentally deficient but hadn't got a special label. But it was quite clear that a very large number of them could be identified afterwards as autistic. It took a long time until people realised that it wasn't only children that had autism, but when these children grew up, became adult, they were still autistic. So a neurodevelopmental disorder like autism is for life. However, the behavioural signs change with age. The behaviour cannot be listed in a catalogue so that you can say you need to show 
for example, a very good memory, an inability to um, to distinguish between a person and a piece of furniture. It's not possible to do that because the behavior differs according to age and ability and all sorts of other things. And yet, it's the only way to diagnose autism. There is no biological test for it as yet. We know it's a biologically caused disorder, but we have no idea how to capture this. We have some hopes that we can see some kind of biomarker in the brain. There's possibly not the structure so much of the brain, but the function of the brain, the way that different regions in the brain connect with each other. That's probably where we will eventually find the first kind of biomarker. But at the moment, all we have is behavioral science and the clinician's judgment and intuition. And here is something interesting. The experienced clinician can identify autism very quickly and agree with people around the world. And it's interesting to think why we can do this when it is in fact such a very heterogeneous disorder, so different from different individuals. Now, I think it's the key to explaining what is different in people with autism. And the key is what we might call reciprocal communication. So when we communicate with each other, mostly in language, of course, it's what we do, but it doesn't have to be words. It could be signs, it could be touch, it could be some other things. When we do this, normally, it's a very fluid, unconscious turn-taking. We take into account what the other person already knows, doesn't know, we like to tell something new and interesting, not boring, same thing all over again. And with the autistic person, this seems to be missing. But when you are in an attempt to have a conversation with an autistic person, this just doesn't happen. There isn't this turn-taking and this reciprocal interplay. And this is why it very often happens that autistic person will tell you the same thing over and over again, things that you know already, things that have to do with their own special interests. And it's not easy for them to see when other people might just wish to change the topic, might ask something else. That is just a, a, a very strong example of what is missing in the social interaction in autism. And that is critical. Now, you might think that's not such a serious matter, but it turns out to be incredibly serious because it, given that it already starts very, very early in infancy, you can imagine that if you have no reciprocal relationship to other people, it would be very difficult to learn things via teaching, you might just not be attuned to picking up what's important, what's interesting. You go your own way. You behave as if you were alone in the world. And in fact, that's where the name autism comes from. Autism comes from the Greek otos, which means self. So just the self and as if nothing else counted. So it is very serious. However, it is true that during life, during the lifespan, um, children, as they grow up, do learn slowly and with effort, and they can, some of them, adapt to society. Not in this millisecond to millisecond um, tracking of other people's beliefs and feelings that we need to do when we interact, but in a slower way, so that they can interact sometimes very well when it's at a distance, when they can use email. Because they can then think about the answer, they can study what you said. So this is a different form of communication, of course, that they can achieve. 
not all of them, because a quite large proportion of autistic individuals, probably half, possibly more than half, have additional additional neurological problems, which include very often mental retardation or learning disability, which it manifests itself as not doing very well on on IQ tests, on tasks that you give them. It means also probably that their language is rather limited, less uh, fluent than it might be. They quite often have um, epilepsy as a condition that also needs to be treated um, in, in its own right. And that can produce great difficulties because they don't have this easy turn-taking and alignment to other people, um, they often behave very badly. That's how we see it. They don't fit in. They, they seem to be um, misbehaving a lot of the time. They do things that uh, social pressures in our normal life would tell us, no, it is not the thing to do now. You know, we, we still uh, believe that there is some truth to Kanna's assessment that they can't tell such easily the difference between how to re relate to people and how to relate to objects in space. We now talk about a spectrum of autism, which means that there are amazing differences between different individuals. So you can have one child who doesn't speak at all, who has severe learning disabilities, who is really, really very uh, alone with himself. And on the other extreme, you have a person who is highly intelligent, has some very specialist interest, possibly great talent, maybe is a chess master, but doesn't do very much else and still doesn't fit into society in the normal way. And in the middle, you have all sorts of shades in between of people who can manage reasonably well with support, with help, and others who really need a lot of help and need to be looked after um, all the time. So the main questions at the moment we are all wanting to know is what causes autism and we do now agree that the causes are genetic factors and it's not as if you could find one or two or even three genes it's like hundreds of genes that are sort of involved and interact with each other that lead to different forms of autism which still, in the end, have the effect. They have, it's a kind of bottleneck that, as far as the brain is concerned, in a very large scale, there are certain regions in the brain that are not terribly well connected, whatever the initial causes were. And this is very interesting. We get many, many, we get probably many, many different genetic causes, but possibly fewer um, manifestations of these different causes in the brain. And then again, we get many different manifestations in behavior. So that's why it is a very interesting disorder to consider. And what we have to do in the future is to see what happens in the brain. What actually is this thing that pulls the strings together from all these different biological causes and pulls all the strings together from the different behaviours. We're not quite sure about that, but there are some ideas. And of course, we do want to know what all these possible genetic risk factors are. So people are collecting cases where they can study particular genetic causes, but it's almost like every single case has a different um, genetic basis. So it's adding up, it's adding up uh, all the time. And I think we can probably now explain about 20% of all causes of autism via known genetic factors, even so they're all different, all variable. And the rest we expect we will know um, in the future. Mm -hmm.